please be seated. And it is now my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this morning, practitioner Jennifer Williams, Livingston. <laughs> Old habits die hard. <laughs> Sorry, Carl. <laughs> Practitioner Jennifer Livingston will be bringing us the encouraging message this morning. Please help me to welcome her. She is a dedicated practitioner of the principles of science of mind. Good morning, friends. Um, let me also add my own words of welcome to all of you and especially to those of you tuned into this service on the World Wide Web. And I truly want to applaud you this morning because it really was a morning that you felt like you could stay in bed. But you see, I was the speaker this morning, so I had to be here for you. So thank you all for turning up. Um, I want to thank Carol for that guided meditation and her beautiful treatment of oneness to set the tone for the remainder of the service. And as always, it is my pleasure to really share with you from the podium in whatever capacity that I am asked to do. As you are all aware, we are in the month of June. And while the 21st day marks the official start of summer, it has been hot even before that date, and you can well attest to that. Yet we have been getting lots of rains like we had this morning, which has been cooling us down and at times uh, more than we can manage, right? But June also marks the sixth month since we completed our New Year Spiritual Mind Healing Workshop and set our goals for 2017. Do you recall what those goals are? Anybody? And how are we doing towards achieving them? Have you checked? Have you looked back at your list? Okay, are we getting there? Okay. So what is it that will sustain us in those times when the goal may be taking longer than anticipated or may not be turning out quite as we had expected? It is at those times that we will need to have faith that things are working out as it should. So this morning, my encouragement is entitled, Sustaining Faith Will Carry You Through. Many of us come to faith as a last resort. Oftentimes, we will try everything in our conscious power to make things happen. And when all else fails, we will have no alternative but to trust. For some of us, faith comes as a result of a dramatic experience, while for others, it develops gradually. It doesn't matter, however, how we come to exercise this faith. As practitioners of this teaching of the science of mind, which we all are, since we are studying science of mind, we know that there is a universal law which receives the direct impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. This energy can also respond, can only respond, I'm sorry, by correspondence. And what this means is that the measure of our faith in the infinite good is the measure of our capacity to draw from it. This is why the master teacher, Jesus said, and I quote, it is done unto you as you believe. It is according to our faith that life demonstrates through us. Friends, we are all very familiar with the biblical passage in Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, which states, and I quote, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In that biblical reference, in, the above, in that passage, it is often quoted as a description of what faith is. But what exactly is it? Faith has been recognized as a power throughout the ages. Whether it is faith in God, faith in oneself, faith in our fellow man. In this entire chapter of Hebrews 11, it speaks to the idea of faith being embodied 
by many of the persons who were written about in the Old Testament, such as Noah or Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And it indicates, therefore, that the idea and acceptance of faith existed even before the teachings of Jesus, the master teacher. In the Science of Mind, our textbook, on page 156, our founder, Dr. Ernest Holm, further expounds on this passage by stating, and I quote, the thought of faith molds the undifferentiated substance and brings into manifestation the thing which was fashioned in the mind. This is how faith brings our desires to pass." End of quote. We are fully aware that this substance is all around us, equally and evenly present, and is available to all. The degree to which we manifest our desires is dependent on our belief and acceptance of the good. Caroline Reynolds, in her book, Spiritual Fitness, How to Live in Truth and Trust, a course we offered here at the temple, and one in which I participated, states, it is on this issue of all pervasiveness, many people stop short having dipped their toes into the deep waters of faith, they will trust enough to allow an angel to find them a parking space. Yet when it comes to the more serious issues of finances or career, for example, they will prefer to take this matter of faith into their own hands." End of that quote. She then references the book, A Course in Miracles, which tells us that we cannot serve two masters. You can't have a bit of faith for the smaller things in life, but none for the bigger ones. Faith is an absolute, and as such, it demands your complete belief in and obedience to a higher power. If you use faith in some area of your life and fear-based reason in others, you will actually negate the effects of your faith throughout. Dr. Holmes, in his book, Can We Talk to God, also states, and I quote, if we wish to prove that there is a spiritual principle which we may definitely use, then let us forego any sense of coercion and become as a little child in receptivity. Let us definitely and consciously accept our good and continue accepting until we experience it." End of quote. This brings me to a story which was shared with us by our own Dr. Elmo. And some of you may have heard it before. And it's the story of a little boy who asked his parents for a bicycle for Christmas. Anybody familiar with that story? You may have heard it. And although he was told by his parents that they couldn't afford it, the little boy kept riding up and down through the house every day on his imaginary bicycle. <laughs> vroom, 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 and around and around he went. This went on for weeks. Then just around the time approaching the holidays, a neighbor down the street came by one afternoon, rang the doorbell, and said to the mother, we will be moving house, and we are packing, but our son has now outgrown his bicycle, and we were wondering if you would accept it for your son. The mother was so overcome as she accepted the generous gifts. Friends, a good-natured flexibility in with oneself and a faith persisting in the face of anything which would contradict it is the only way to approach our life and affairs. Yet, as we continue to examine this matter of faith within our own human experience, we find that there's no one way to describe it, and often, it is based on our feelings of hopefulness or hopelessness. We can easily demonstrate our most fervent desires when we are feeling positive, optimistic, and full of joy. And at these times, our faith can sustain us. And it is enough to see us through. But on the other hand, 
when we are feeling less than hopeful and we cannot see our way, at these times our faith is diluted. But it is precisely at those times, however, when we feel less than hopeful that we are reminded of the words of the master teacher when he says in Luke 17 and verse 6, if he had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye might say to the sycamore tree, be thou plucked up by the roots and be thou planted in the sea and it shall obey you. End of that scripture. In my own experience, I have seen where faith has sustained me through many challenges, such as when I was unemployed and looking for a job, despite being told that how difficult that would be, it was the faith in my abilities and that guiding principle within that I was able to find right employment. But as we look at the nature and function of faith throughout our lives, let us explore the ideas shared by a Reverend Bernardo Monsterat, a new thought minister in his book, Faith It Till You Make It. Yes, you're all familiar with the line, fake it till you make it. Well, the title of his book is Faith It Till You Make It. And in it, he outlines that during our lifetime, our faith passes through four continuums, the first of which is natural faith. A natural faith, this is the faith we are born with. It is more a childlike faith and nothing can take away our natural faith. But we ourselves may often give it away. In this stage, we're usually optimistic and hopeful and we tend to give God a personality. In times of stressful situations, however, often our natural faith is eroded or lost, and this is termed lost faith. And this is the second stage. When this occurs, we tend to deny God. In this state, we are likely to see ourselves as victims and blame others for circumstances. The probability of praying with a conviction for a desirable outcome is doubtful. And it is important, he says, that we know that even in this state, our faith is still there, and something in us still wants to believe. Reverend Bernardo points out that even in the face of these challenges, our faith in God can be restored through support and education. And as we mature, we are better able to recognize our inner capabilities and clearly understand our outer circumstances. We may even embark on an intellectual study of God and the spiritual practices with which we can commune with God. This is what happens when we pass through the third stage and it is called educated faith. In this faith level, we are in partnership with God. In the fourth continuum, known as enlightened faith, this is a mental and emotional state where we embrace our divinity and oneness with God and all whom we encounter, and we entertain no thought of separation. In this level, we believe that our life has purpose and meaning, and we continually accept a state of blissful existence and experience. So the four continuums again, natural faith, lost faith, then it's an educated faith until we move to our enlightened faith. Friends, while we might not be able to clearly identify these distinct phases through which our faith passes, we must be patient with ourselves as we strive to live in this greater experience of oneness with God, oneness with our good, and oneness with each other. And as such, we need to take the time to develop our faith through our continued spiritual practices of affirmative prayer, meditation, and the use of affirmations, which we can use in times of need. I would like to share with you now two such affirmations. I'll read them once and you can repeat after me. And the first is, 
No matter the challenges I may encounter, I can remain in faith. And the second, I have complete confidence. I do not waver or falter in my faith, for I know that God is the only presence there is. So let's do the first one. No matter the challenges, no matter the challenges I may encounter, I know I can remain in faith. And the second, I have complete confidence. I have complete confidence. I'm not sounding so convinced. Let's go again. <laughs> I have complete confidence. I have complete confidence. I do not waver or falter in my faith. I do not waver or falter in my faith. For I know that God is the only presence there is. For I know that God is the only presence there is. And so it is. Thank you. So while we have mainly looked at faith in accomplishing our desires, we also need to exercise this faith when we are faced with lives with life's unexpected situations. So how many of you were here on the first Sunday when Reverend John also shared an affirmation with us, which was part of our assignment that week? Were you here? Anybody? Nobody? Well, Reverend John was here. There you go. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and do you remember what it was? No. <laughs> Not even Reverend John. No, no. Well, Reverend John, it went like this. God is my pilot. Faith is my beacon light. And I am anchored in peace. Sounds familiar? God is my pilot. Faith is my beacon light and I am anchored in peace. Carol whispered, she wasn't here. Okay, Carol, <laughs> make notes. And sure enough, I went on a business trip that same week to Panama to what was a very intense business planning meeting. So I was working with the affirmation every morning before going to the office. God is my pilot, faith is my beacon light, and I'm anchored in peace. But little did I know that I would need the affirmation more on my return trip to Jamaica. Friends, my flight was delayed out of Miami that Friday I was coming back. We should have departed at 6.20, and we left at 7.20 p.m. instead. And there was a group of persons traveling, one of whom I knew, she was in, she's in, in insurance, and so I assumed they had gone to some conference. I really didn't ask, I just chit-chatted with her, in the departure lounge, and we boarded the flight. And I was seated in seat 12A, a window seat. And in the row in front of me, in 11C, that's the aisle seat, a gentleman was seated who was part of this group. My friend had actually exchanged seats with him, and he was having a conversation with a lady in the window seat of that row. That's row 11. So I dozed off, as I'm known to do, my favorite position on a plane. It had been a long day, and I had been in the airport for over seven hours. So I was really exhausted. And it was a somewhat bumpy flight, but I can sleep through any conditions. Because I woke up, yes, yes, I woke up to hear the flight attendant offering water as they would not be serving refreshments. So I rehydrated myself and closed my eyes to settle back into sleep when immediately I heard the announcement, everyone please take your seats and keep the passage clear. Of course, now I opened my eyes and she repeated, everyone please remain in your seats and keep the passage clear. But this time around she added, is there a medical doctor on board? By which time, everyone now wanted to see what was happening in the middle of the plane. But, of course, but they remained seated, which was good. She made the appeal once again. Is there a medical doctor on board? And this time, a lady came rushing from the front of the plane, armed with some medical device, and the purser also came with some other device, and they were all busy working in the middle of the plane. But keep in mind, we are 35,000 feet up in the air. We are closer to Kingston than we are to Miami, so there's no turning back. And at the same time, the lady in the window seat of row 11 said to the young man in the middle of the plane, let me pass, let me pass so I can see. 
who it is. So as she got to the end seat, which was vacant, the gentleman had gone to the bathroom. She cried out, oh no, it's Gregory. And she wanted to rush down the passage. At which time I said to her, no, don't do that. You know, we have been asked to stay in our seats. Friends, in all of this, I could feel my anxiety level rising. And I started to say a prayer, but the words were not coming out. And as I was, it was as if I was holding my breath. It also seemed like it was taking forever to revive this man in that moment I just started to repeat the affirmation, God is my pilot, faith is my beacon light, and I'm anchored in peace, because that was what was coming. And indeed, coming out of that experience, God was indeed the pilot of that plane, because they were able to revive the gentleman so that he could sit up and he had something to drink. But what was interesting about this whole experience was after that was over, the person then announced that the female flight attendant, Amy Louise, who was handling the situation, was only six months on the job, having been confirmed as a flight attendant that week. Talk about a baptism by fire. But no, she was the right person in the right place at the right time because her training was so fresh. When we landed at Norman Manley, the ambulance was waiting, and they came on board, and they wheeled him off. And as we alighted from the plane, we could see that the paramedics were attending to him out in the terminal, and he was looking much better. Friends, I share the story with you to let you know that staying with the affirmation in that kind of situation was what was taking me through the whole experience. And while it did help to release my anxiety and to know that I could trust in that infinite power and presence, I won't tell you that it was easy, because it wasn't. But it takes, us, it takes courage and focus. And this could easily be likened to when the master teacher Jesus said to his disciples, O ye of little faith. But as Reverend Bernarda says, we never really lose our natural faith. Fortunately, faith is something that grows the more that you use it. And as you see your prayers being answered, you will be encouraged to trust more and more deeply in that infinite presence. Dr. Holmes states in the Science of Mind textbook, if a man is seeking to demonstrate, he must tell himself that he has faith in his power, in his ability, in the principle, and in the certainty of the demonstration for which he works. Faith being a mental attitude is according to law, and even though one doubts, one can overcome these doubts and create the desired faith definitely. End of that quote. As we conclude, let us remind ourselves of what it will take for us to have a sustaining faith that will see us through any obstacles or unexpected situations that may arise. And here I'll recap. One, know that it is done unto us as we believe. So let us be ever mindful of what we impress upon our belief system. Two, if we have faith but as a grain of mustard seed, we can remove mountains. All we need to do is trust the process. And three, as we work on strengthening our faith, more and more, we receive the answers to our prayers. Friends, when your faith blooms into your manifested reality, you will feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude and connection with the universal life force. And you will know, as James Allen states in his book, From Poverty to Power, to follow under all circumstances the highest promptings within you, to be always true to the divine self, to rely upon the inward light, the inward voice, and to pursue your purpose with a fearless, restful heart. This is faith 
and the living of faith. My friends, a faith-filled second half of the year to you as you realize your dreams, knowing that sustaining faith will carry you through. Namaste.